and welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnon. And me, William Durrumpel. So this is the shiny second bonus episode, if you like, of what was going to be a series about the Ottoman Empire. But then we stretched because we thought, how can you understand the Ottoman Empire unless you understand the Byzantine Empire that it replaced? Uh, And once again, I'm very excited to say, because you love him, uh, obviously you do, it's our inbox is full of Frankopan love. We're joined by Peter Frankopan. The great Peter Frankopan. And uh, we were talking about Byzantium. And when we left you, the Crusades had begun. Uh, and begun this era of conflict between Christianity and Islam and the Seljuk Turks were pouring into Anatolia. Uh, Where do you want to take us next to, Anita? Can I take you forward a little bit more to the Fourth Crusade of 1204? Because this, you know, we've got this impression here, when you think about the Crusades in Britain, you've got Robin of Loxley and Richard the Lionheart, and they're all going to fight the good fight. And if they're done down, it's because of treachery at home. And yet there is treachery of an epic scale in 1204 that is not really talked about, where it's sort of Christian on Christian. Can you you tell us what happens here? It it is talked about a lot in Greece. Uh, It's talked a lot in Croatia too. So so basically by by about the year 1200, you've got crusade fatigue. So there are too many of these expeditions out to the east. And Richard the Lionheart, very good looking himself in the mirror, goes out on a sort of uh, year off with King of France and Frederick Barbarossa, who probably drowns wearing his armor trying to cross the river you know, because he had underestimated you know, schoolboy error. And you know, these ex- expeditions are incredibly expensive. You have to tax people to high heaven and they don't achieve anything apart from sort of films with Anthony Andrews and, <laughs> and sort of uh, you know, the idea that somehow these are chivalrous knights rather than they're, they're totally incompetent and useless. It inspires a lot, of, uh, a lot of English football supporters going to Qatar, it has to be said. Well, you know, it's an amazing thing. And they're all wearing the Cross of St. George, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a knight from southern, what's now southern Turkey. You know, it's sort of amazing. These, these ideas got brought back. Anyway, that's for another podcast. Uh, so by the 1190s, the idea that there should be yet another crusade it sounds good on paper, but in practice, people just aren't really interested. So Saladin conquers Jerusalem in 1187. There's a, what's called the Third Crusade. It depends how you number them, but they're typically called the Third Crusade uh, with the kings of England, France, and, and Germany, which achieves very little, huge expense. At, and then Richard even gets himself locked up by the police on the well, by the Austrians, the same sort of thing. On the way back, a total shambles. Breathalyzed in Austria. Breathalyzed, and yeah, exactly right. And then, so less than 10 years afterwards, there's an idea, let, let's go again. And a couple of chancers go and hire Venice to basically shut down their entire economy for two years to build enough ships for the vast numbers of people who are bound to show up for the for the for the for the crack, who then don't. And the Venetians sit there, you know, with their hands on their head, going, you know, you're seriously joking, and you're <laughs> going to pay us what you owe us. We you promised uh, you promised us eighty five thousand uh, silver ducats. And the Crusaders like we've checked our pockets. We could probably, probably for silver marks, rather, we could probably give you about a third. And the Venetians, who are you know smart business people, like uh, you know our bankers here, they don't really let you write your money off if you can't pay. So the Crusaders have another whip around. They go, we found a little bit more, but we're basically not going to eat for a while. And the Venetians say, even that, you're still barely at half of what we're owed. So they say, I'll tell you what, we've got we've got one idea, which is that on your way, we've got some cities on the Dalmatian coast who have been cheeky enough to say that they don't think we're as powerful as we say we are. But if you knock them over or scare the living daylights out of them, you know, we'll, we'll give you some credit for that. So the Crusaders then go to the city of Zara, which is now, now Zadar in Croatia, and the, they line up to attack. And the inhabitants start hanging sheets over the walls with a cross on saying, we're Christians, you've got the wrong, you know, you're miles away from, <laughs> from the Holy Land. You know, you've got thousands, you know, thousands of nights of sleepless nights. Jerusalem <laughs> this way. Right, uh, yeah. But they go in and so they go in and sack anyway, because the Venetians say, well, this is the price you pay of doing business and getting it wrong. Uh, and then that sort of escalates uh, uh, above and beyond. They get the, the Venetians or the fleet rather gets messages from a rival's for the throne in Constantinople, saying, if you come and help sort us out, if I get to the throne, I'll pay you back. And so in 1203, they reach uh, the walls of Constantinople, and one of the guys trying to get hold of the throne, Alexius IV Angelos, so an imperial dynasty, and, you know, uh, the very divided time, sort of 
think Brexit or think, you know, Trump, you know, lots of people claiming things one way and then the other, huge unpopularity, no one agreeing with each other. Eventually, Alexis Paul takes the throne and uh, he says, whoops, I'm afraid I'm really embarrassing, guys. Haven't really got all the cash. So if you could spare, bear with me for a little bit. And the Crusaders go, look, we, we've all left home. We're on our way to Jerusalem. I've got my wife. I'm like Baldwin of Flanders. is like super, super interested in his wife. Told her to go meet him in, uh, in Acre, the, a landing port for the Holy Land. So she's on her way there. And so the Crusaders go, look, we have to, enough of this. And they and they they say we've got the siege engines to take you know big cities in in the in the middle in the Near East anyway. Let's set them against Constantinople. And so in twelve oh four, they eventually break into the city and they go. There's some version of ballistic. It used to be thought that they went properly ballistic, ransacked everything. Uh, there are stories of prostitutes dancing on the altar in Hagia Sophia and the Great Cathedral. Um, you know clearly the the great treasuries are absolutely ransacked. So. Tre- so gold, gold and, and relics and treasure, treasures are all shipped back to Europe in some epic proportions, particularly to Venice. And then the Crusaders think, well, a little bit awkward because we're not quite sure what we should do now. And they say, well, what about if we, one of us becomes emperor? And the sort of wonderfully named Boniface of Montferrat, who's the kind of prime joker behind the promising the Venetians how many would come, can't really swing it. So they go, well, that guy Baldwin, he seems quite a good guy. And even if it, he's like, my wife is on her way to, but okay, I'll give it a shot. And so they then divide, they, they carve up the empire amongst themselves. The Byzantine emperor, as he was, gets pushed out to the city of Nicaea, which people will know as the, for, as the home of the Nicaean Creed. You know, it's a big city in Western Asia Minor, sets up a court there. Another wing sets up itself in Epirus, what's now sort of northwestern Greece and Albania, uh, in a kind of notional empire of Epirus. And this splintering means that there's a kind of Latin core where these guys don't know what they're doing. And the best way you can show that they don't know what they're doing is that um, they argue, they start arguing with each other. Boniface says, well, I, I want to be the king of Thessaloniki because that's quite a good thing to call myself. And Baldwin is not that keen on it. But they then both have to go and fight against the Bulgarians. The Bulgarians are on the move because the Bulgarians are always on the move. They've got a second empire they've been building. They capture Baldwin in battle and then decapitate him. And uh, they say, well, bully for that. So for the next 50 years, the Latins sit in Constantinople. They don't bother going to, to Jerusalem. Uh, they run the sort of the core of the empire, but they do it incredibly badly. They eventually, like always happens with Europeans, they kind of lose interest. Their sons don't really want to come out and join them unless they get like proper entitles and very cute wives, which th- th- are in very short supply. And eventually by 1261, the Byzantines in, in Nicaea go, I'll tell you what, lads. We'll take it from here, and then we get to the to the sort of the next act of the Byzantine Empire of, of Constantinople back in Roman hands, or as we call them, Byzantine hands. So, Peter, we've had lots of toing and froings in Byzantium. Meanwhile, in Anatolia, the Seljuks, who've been building up their kingdom very nicely, thank you, uh, in the middle of Anatolia, have their own problems because in 1243 the Mongols sweep in. Yeah, so the Mongols uh, are the great empire builders, probably the greatest empire builders in history. So from the late 1100s, Chinggis Khan and then his sons are able to bring uh, from the plains of Mongolia, basically the entirety, almost the entirety of what's now China, right the way through Central Asia. And by 1242, they reach um, Central Hungary, then sweep down through the Dalmatian coast. And at the same time, they have a spur coming through through the Middle East towards Byzantium from that direction too. So the, the Mongols are fantastically able and adept. But the problem, I think, is for, for the Seljuks is that with, with nomad groupings or, or mobile groupings, retaining sole power is quite tricky because um, you need to have the right or level of authority. You don't typically, these societies don't practice primogenitor where the sort of chinless one, the eldest son, always inherits or the very capable elder son inherits, it's through uh, agreement. So, so what happens is the Seljuks, uh, it, it, or quite often with these confederations, they tend to splinter because second cousins, third cousins have their own sort of ambitions or they feel thwarted. And so they can be quite fragile. So when the Mongols come, it's not so much that they snooker the Seljuks or put them out of business. It's more that it's a kind of brittle world that's looking for, I suppose, electricity looking for lightning. And the Mongols, as they come in, the big question is, are they going to be permanent? or not. But the more important thing is that, uh, for, for the context of the, particularly the Near and Middle East, is that in 1258, the Mongols sack the city of Baghdad. And according to one of the 
Ottoman sort of creation stories that's written about 100 years later, that is the very day that Uthman or Usman is born. And Usman is the sort of the father of the Ottoman in, of the Ottoman dynasty. He, as I said, we know absolutely zero about him. He's probably born at some point in the 1250s. But what he's good at doing, and, and probably why his name comes from the Arabic Uthman, which means wise, is that he's he, like the Seljuks and like all successful politicians of all kinds, is, is very good at, at striking deals. And he's very good at offering rewards to the right kinds of people at the right kind of time. So he's able to build a small sort of emirate, I suppose we call it, or small sort of little little hub into something that's much bigger, and sometimes by accommodation, sometimes by conquests. But one of the things that people think about Osman and his successors quite early on is the idea that they are going to build a great empire. And so the great dream of Osman, which is sort of foundational in the kind of stories of the Ottoman empires, is that he goes to visit the house of a you know, very powerful figure. And he says uh, in his dream, he dreams that, that a tree sprouts from his navel. And from that tree creates a world that's fully shaded. And all from that shade, you find mountains, you find streams, people making, building gardens, planting orchards, setting up fountains and so on. And he then reports this to the powerful person he's been to, to see, who says to him, oh, thank God, you're the chosen one. From you are going to be the source that grows this great empire. By the way, I've got a daughter literally in the room next door. It would be really great if you would think about connecting with her because the two of us together, we could get stuck in. And so the Ottomans start to sort of mushroom into a kind of back, into a void, they build into a void where they're able to deliver rewards for an interest group. And then as that acceleration starts to happen, they become more and more powerful. So they're not, they're not, they're not conquering by having more children. It's not a kind of migration of large numbers of people. It's through very careful choosing battles that you're going to win and then go through those. I'm really, I'm fascinated by this because this sort of dream of Osman, so suddenly you've got um, a people who believe in a destiny that is preordained. You know, there's a mysticism about it. Um, on the other hand, you've also got the, the Byzantines who also believe they are given by God. You know, they, they, you know they've got the, the mother of God protecting their, their great wall. They are also destined and protected by the supernatural. How are they reacting to this other prophecy by another God, you know, people of the book, El Ekatab, after all, these are all people of the book, and they've got their prophecy, they've got their prophecy. How is this all working out? Well, so the Roman so imperial structure isn't a, isn't a expansionist evangelical empire. I mean, there are lots of evangelicals and evangelists who head out into the steppes and head out, in fact, reaching China by the, seven, by the 630s, uh, we find steelies or sort of, uh, you know, monuments that record the arrival of Christian missionaries. But the Roman Empire isn't in the, isn't in the business of trying to expand its territory to bring out about more Christians. The, the, the protection of God is to protect them from disaster rather than to give them the God-given right to be on earth and so on. So the root of the Ottomans is slightly different insofar as the idea that you are you're going to inherit and be blessed by the good Lord is slightly different. But the, the Romans have been in business for five, six, seven hundred years by this time. So they, they sort of have quite a good awareness of what their limitations are, what they're good at. And they're not sitting there around the campfire or in their imperial palace plotting the destruction of great empires far away. They're, they're first of all, keen on stability. They've got a really smart civil service, a foreign office, who, who can see problems coming. They're, they're very good at gathering information about who's who. They're very good about working out how to invite them to the state visits and you know and so on. They're very, very good at giving titles. They're very good at working out how to make marriages so you can calm people. And they're very good to know what it is that people actually want. And what people really want is improved quality of life, higher living standards, and more of the good stuff, silks, gold, etc. And if you can keep on providing that, then then fine. The, the problem is for the, for the Roman Empire, uh, as, as the Ottomans start to rise, is you have the kind of equivalent of our recent, I was going to say dear departed, but certainly our departed Prime Minister Liz Truss, where we have a fiscal event in the kind of late 1200s, <laughs> where <laughs> one uh, smart-ass emperor decides that this is the right moment to cut taxes on the rich and to start debasing the currency to make everybody live in the happy ever after. And, um, and, and that, that suddenly creates very disgruntled, extremely pissed off population who think, well, maybe there are other answers. And maybe the fact that we seem to be in what's lurching from one crisis to the next means that may- maybe this is the kind of the beginning of an end, the be- beginning of the end. And that, that's, that's, I suppose, something that we can perhaps relate to today's world too. Blimey, a fiscal. I, mean, I, I, I didn't know. I had no idea. Sorry, I'm, let me being just astonished for a second. William, 
So these the Ottomans now we have we have first of all the first generation uh, after whom the, the the TV show is named Ertuğrul, right? And Osman is his son. Tell us about those two. Well, I think you just as well watching Netflix. I mean, we don't know anything about them. I mean, so it's, it's all projecting backwards. Of course, they're valiant, glorious, wise, clever. You know, uh, good with kids, with, with pets, etc. I, I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> nice to grannies. Nice to grannies. Bags and table manners. Uh, you know, I think I think that these are people who are mobile are very. Uh, they're tough. They're hardy, like like the Scots. You know, no airs and graces. And uh, but having no airs and graces doesn't mean you're not kind, sympathetic. Doesn't mean you're not clever. But also doesn't mean you are clever. But it, but it means that you are you're quite you're quite grizzled and you're quite determined. And the, the key thing is is to work out how do you unlock rewards. I mean, so it's a, it's a good friend of mine, Nicola de Cosmo, a great scholar of Inner Asia, uh, puts it, is that, is that the, the, the function of all nomadic empires is to be constantly generating rewards. You know, you need, you need to be bringing back more and more stuff all the time. So that means that your horizons have to be constantly moving and the size of your targets needs to be increasing. And the Ottomans' horizons are definitely expanding at this point. They're moving westwards. They're moving into Bursa. They're moving into the uh, the coastline of uh, Bithynia. Yeah, you 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 take what you you you're opportunistic. You know, you you take as low hanging fruit as you can, which offers little risk because if you risk everything on one single battle, then you're then you're toast. So in 1331, Nicaea, which you know as I mentioned, was the kind of the second home of the Byzantine emperor in his, in his uh, exile from Constantinople, falls to the Ottomans in 1331. And that then becomes a kind of, that's a, that's a seminal moment because Nicaea is the, ta- is the city that controls access through to the coasts and, and more or less spells the kind of the, the end of uh, Roman and Christian rule in Asia Minor in the East. And that, that, that then is followed in the next decade by Black Death. And when Black Death comes, you have massive depopulation across all parts of the known world, except possibly not Poland, where we'd see very little mortality from plague. But that demographic shock then plays through at the same time as civil war, another kickoff between who's, who's, who, who's in charge of the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople. And so that, it's, a bit like a, it's a bit like a sugar cube being dissolved. It's one thing goes from worse to worse, which is really bad if you're Byzantine. But it's that's great if you're on the rise, as the Ottomans are. So uh, the crossover across the Hellas, across the Dardanelles, uh, into Europe by by the 1360s. Um, so about 30 years after Nicaea falls, by the 1360s, you find the Ottomans deep inside the Balkan interior in Philippopolis, modern Plovdiv, and Adrianople, modern Idirne. Yeah. And they've just gone right round Constantinople. Yeah, they, they've just avoided it, and 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 gone round it. Why? Because it's so fortified, and because it is this place that you can't get to easily, or they're not interested. They're of lower hanging fruit. What what is the reason to just ignore it as if it's not there? Bit of both. I mean, why bother? First of all, I mean, do, what what is it you gain? Uh, second, if you can, you know, round up and sack smaller targets, you're generating those rewards that I mentioned. Uh, it doesn't tie up resource and manpower. You have no no risk of failure if you can keep on taking more assets off the emperor, you're reducing his tax that he is able to benefit from, so you weaken him further still. So the throttling effect is quite a successful one. And it's not necessary that you need to knock out every single target you you see. Again, I think it's how we think about modern warfare, that you kind of you send the army as a kind of line. But leaving pockets, mm. uh, you know, those, those could last for a very long time. But I mean, as you say, Anita, the city of Constantinople has some of the most epic fortifications of any site in the world. The, the walls of uh, of Theodosius in particular, and then re- re-fortified by another Comnenian emperor in the 12th century to keep away the Second Crusaders. I mean, this is a, it's, a, it's not quite an impregnable target, despite what happens in 1204, but you need to have a lot of manpower and you'd have a lot of the right kind of manpower. So I know in your next podcast, you're going to talk about the fall of the city itself, but you, you need to have yeah. the right kind of people with the right kind of equipment. And the Ottomans could put lots of men into the field, but siege warfare is a different thing to winning battles Overland. So by the 1360s, 1370s, decisions be made to just move northwards. Uh, by 1389, the Battle of Kosovo, almost the entirety of the Serbian aristocracy is knocked out uh, and killed. By third, but four years later, basically what's now Bulgaria falls under Ottoman control. And so often that's done through battles, but it's often it's done through accommodation, which is that we'll take over, we'll maybe keep some of your people in place, we'll recognize their titles, maybe even give you tax breaks. 
but you know, you now the person who you're sending your checks to every month is going to be me, not to, not to that guy sitting in Constantinople. So, with the Ottomans now becoming the dominant power in the Balkans, I think it's time to take a break. Welcome back to Empire. So we're in the late 14th century, and um, am I right in thinking that we now have vampires in this story? <laughs> you are. We needed more <laughs> texture and excitement. We now have vampires. We didn't have enough vampires uh, in the first episode of Series 2, so we are going to uh, start with the greatest vampire of them all, because one of the people who turn up at the Ottoman capital of Bursa at this point is none other than the future Count Dracula, Vlad no. the Impaler, uh, no. who comes in the 1420s to Bursa. Well, I mean, we've talked about taxation. This is blood sucking of an entirely different type. So, yes, <laughs> t- tell me, what is the role of, of Vlad the Imp- the young lad, the Impaler? Because he's quite young here. Lad the Impaler, how does he fit in? Well, yeah. You know, th- I think, th- I think you know, most people don't want to be be you know most people want what they know and the arrival of a massive juggernaut that's generating power and trying to redistribute everybody's land is not surprisingly not particularly welcomed and so you've got a choice which is you stand and fight and you end up being massacred like like in kosovo which is the the kind of the single biggest moment in serbian history today you know i mean that's why and when the breakup of Yugoslavia happened, you know, that's why Kosovo has been such an important part of the last 30, 40 years, because of the historical legacies of, of huge setbacks and the loss of heartlands and so on. But so Vlad is, is quite effective at, at leading resistance in Valachia, so what's, what's sort of now broadly uh, Western Romania, against Ottoman incursions. But, you know, your, your luck always runs out at a certain point, either because, you know, you're overwhelmed by numbers or you're sold by members of your own side, or you just have a bad day at the office. And you know, so Vlad you know, achieves a certain notoriety here for the way in which he's, he tries to use extreme violence as a way of stopping further incursions and to try to broker a, a peace agreement. Extreme violence, in this case, being mass impalement of the Turks. Well, you know, I think, I think you know, the risk of getting all the people bringing in to complain, you know, I think that violence and military violence is used in a different way in the in the pre-modern world, you know, we, we, we were taught at school that, you know, it's honour and duty to die for your country, line up by machine guns and get mowed down by the First World War. But I can promise you for most of human history, no one went into battle thinking this was a great way to die. E- even on crusades, you know, people who wrote about it said, well, they've gone straight to heaven. But I can promise you lots of, the, lots of people who did that weren't as convinced perhaps as, as, as we might be. But I think that in Vlad's case, and in, in, it's a sense that the world is changing very dramatically against your beliefs, Christianity, against your way of life. This new world that's emerging from the steppes and via what the rump of the Byzantine Empire, except for Constantinople, suddenly presents quite existential threats about, about you know, what does God in- intend for us? Is it the apocalypse? Are we going to have a second coming? And shouldn't we fight to try to preserve ourselves while we still can stay safe? But, you know, that all goes wrong. I mean, but before Vlad, in 1396, an attempt of a crusade gets going and they're, they're, they're butchered at Nicopolis in the Balkans. Nicopolis, the Hungarian armies wiped out. Yeah. So at that point, it looks to, you know, that the, the only way the Ottomans get stopped is with a big push by the West to group together, stand up to a big enemy and coordinate. And I suppose if one was being cynical, nobody really bothered. And perhaps even today, you know, despite appearance to the contrary with Ukraine, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very good at, at sending messages of support and a bit of you know weaponry, but actually leading in is a different story. So, in 1399, the, the emperor Manuel II, Paleologus, Paleologus, the sort of late Byzantine dynasty, thinks right. Well, to hell with this! I, I can't just send out letters asking for help. I'm going to go and see people all over Europe and try and convince them to send what we need to hold on to the great to Constantinople and to push back the Muslim Ottoman infidels who are going to tear down. Not just our world, but trust us, after you, they're going to come for Vienna, they're going to come for Milan, they're going to come north. He goes to, he goes to England. He, he comes and spends Christmas in 1400 at Eltham Palace. Yes, you've got to be patient, really. I'd say yes, well, but first, <laughs> before he comes to our blessed isles, he goes to places that are important too. <laughs> Where else? Where else could be as important as Eltham? Tell me one place that's better than England. Uh, he goes to Milan, he goes to see the King of France. And as you, as you rightly say, pre- yeah, uh, he comes to England, arrives in 1400. He, he hangs out with Henry IV, uh, goes jousting with him. And, and sort of English 
commentators are sort of, they, they get slightly sort of peeved. They think that the Byzantines look down on them because they think the English have got terrible fashion sense. How could that be true? How could that be true? Impossible. Uh, but one of the, one of the sort of the most, uh, um, I don't know whether it's moving, but one of the most telling comments is, a, is an English contemporary account who says, this magnificent man with his retinue and amazing kit and, you know, extraordinary dynasty and legacy going back, whatever, uh, is reduced to having to come round the cities of the, the, the countries of Europe begging for help. And as night follows day over the course of the next 30, 40 years, as things become worse and worse and worse, no one sends help, no one sends support, no one sends money. The, the, the sag eventually, as we come towards the gallops towards 1453, it's this great Christian city that's sort of left to hang out to dry. You know, the achievements of Justinian, the, the achievements of the great Macedonians, nice keeper of the focus, they're all condemned to the dust. And in fact, taking us in a circle to where we started, that's why uh, later historians, Gibbon and onwards, or and before and afterwards, uh, talk about the Byzantine Empire in catastrophic terms, because from their point of view, the Byzantines are the great losers in history, because they're the ones who surrendered Constantinople or gave it up. In fact, the last emperor is killed on his way out uh, trying to defend the city, his last scene charging at the Ottoman lines. But I think the idea that, that, that Rome came to an end you know, a thousand years earlier is much more convenient for Western historians because they think that that's, that's the legacy we really want to claim. You know, Commodus and Russell Crowe and Gladiator and Augustus, not these guys who become Christian and therefore are uh, adulterated. You know, they're sort of watering down what it means to be Roman, to be brave, because they figure the only reason why the Byzantine Emperor must have fallen is because these guys were overcomplicated and too busy praying rather than the nitty gritty of fighting. But that's absolutely not the case at all. I mean, just just before we actually get to that sort of final climax, if if, if just circling back to 1402, where, you know, the, the Zelensky figure is going around just begging for, for help and not getting it. And there's, you know, there are those wonderful descriptions of him and his retinue in white robes looking like a choir of angels appearing and saying, help us, please help us, as if they're their heavenly host. I mean, that that Henry the Fourth meeting, there's a, there's a beautiful description of them looking divine and yet completely astonishingly beggarly in front of a court that is not nearly as good as them. You know, so all, all of that is going on. So so you've got, you're sort of creeping up to 1402 and, and they are feeling so much the pressure. So just as it just seems as if everything is going to implode, this tense nervous headache is turning into a migraine, appears on the horizon, Timor, the analgesic for all kinds of terrible headaches. Now, tell us about Timor and tell us why he was so important. He, he's the ibuprofen of the, of the, of, from the Byzantine point of view. So he's the sort of the constructor of the great, of the great successor states of the, built by, the, by Chinggis Khan and the Chinggisids. Uh, Timor is the kind of the, the probably an equal level of empire builder to the great Chinggis Khan himself. And pressure from the East is obviously... Very good news if you're Byzantine, because you want as much, you want your opponent, your, your competitor, to be in a stretch and as as exposed as possible. And in 1402, there's a battle at Battle of Ankara, where Timur and his men absolutely give a proper thumping to the Ottomans, and that that opens opportunities. It probably buys time. A hundred and fifty thousand in in Timur's army, elephants spewing Greek fire, and the Sultan bears it ends up in a cage. Yeah, the, uh, the cage, I believe, a Greek fire, that's fine. That, that's just kind of the, the type of naphtha that the Greeks have worked out how to use as kind of projectiles. And the numbers, I think, are all, all you know, take, take, to take it with a pinch of salt. But I mean, clearly, it's a substantial army. And what, what Timur is interested in doing is making the Ottomans, who are a big target, uh, submit to him. You know, that's what you want. You don't necessarily need to conquer the lands, but you, you need to know that you're the boss and that the Ottomans are going to be in your pocket. Take the knee. Yeah. And pretty much after 1402, immediately afterwards, uh, Timor thinks, right, job done in the West. These guys are a bunch of jokers. They're not a real threat. Now's my time to work to turn eastwards in towards, towards China into what's then the, the Ming dynasty. And in fact, then, then dies in 1405 so without quite completing his, his dreams. That, that pressure that comes onto the Ottomans from the eastern side is, is quite helpful for the Byzantines, the Romans in Constantinople, insofar as it gives opportunities, potentially including alliances with Timur directly, you know. And Timur, after all, it's not a coincidence, he ends up being written about by people like Shakespeare. You know, he becomes considered here in, in the West a kind of salvation figure that will save us from, you know, the great perils. For those who haven't joined those particular dots, it's Tamerlane the Great. Not one of his greatest plays, but it is, that is Timur, that is, yeah. All about that, man. It's not one of his greatest plays, but on the other hand, I was quite surprised that I, I, I was in Cambridge the other day, came from the train station. There's the Tamburlaine Hotel next to the um, 
uh, next to the train station. <laughs> and I'm sort of quite pleased by that in a way. Yeah, yeah. you can check in, but you can never leave. <laughs> That's, it. That's it. Central Asian style. That's it. The Genghis Khan Hotel. Don't go there. Don't go there, Peter. To smash the glass. Stick to, to Oxford. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the, that, that reshuffling of the decks um, in other parts of the world, you know, we forget how interconnected these worlds all are. And, you know, again, going back to my Byzantine, you know, my, my, my field of vision sitting in Constantinople in the periods I particularly work on, you know, does really include sources from Iceland, from Portugal, Spain, from North Africa, from Sub-Saharan Africa, right the way through the Himalayas into South Asia and even into China now. Uh, you know, we're finding lots of artifacts made in the Byzantine world, lots of exchange. So this kind of globalised connections, and of course, up to Scandinavia and down into Ethiopia, and in fact, even further south. So these kind of ways in which the jigsaw is constantly moving means that, you know, you're never quite a master of your destiny. What, what the Byzantines do very well, and in fact, what Timur does quite well, what the Mongols do quite well, is to be constantly balancing different powers. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time in Central Asia today, and there, you know, in a neighbourhood where you've got Russia in the north, China in the east, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan to the south, Iran, you know, you're, you're in quite a complicated neighbourhood, and that requires you to be exactly the same thing that, that the Byzantines did, which is to gather information, to be multilingual, to be highly adaptable, uh, to be able to measure threats and risks carefully. And, you know, I suppose the starting point with the Byzantines is, you know, were they unlucky and they ran out of steam in 1453 eventually, or maybe they could have even made it through that if it wasn't for a particular set of circumstances that I think you'll talk about in the next episode. Is it possible that, in fact, Constantinople had hung on and perhaps things could have turned out differently? A bit like the Ottomans very, very nearly unlocked the gates of Vienna uh, twice, in fact. And if that had happened, maybe things would have looked slightly different. So, in fact, in a new book that I've just, just, just finished, the way in which the Ottomans moved into Europe and put Vienna under pressure was hugely influential in, in what it did for the Reformation, hugely influential in the spread of Martin Luther's ideas, and hugely influential in stopping military conflict between European powers. So these kind of jigsaw pieces that are reacting to each other are really important and fascinating to be looking at and studying. So just before we leave this, just let's have a vision of the world in 1450. What's going on in Byzantium? What's going on with the Ottoman Turks? We last saw the <laughs> poor Bayezid, the Sultan Bayezid, in a cage, captured by Timur after the Battle of Ankara, banging his head against the, the bars of his cage, a captive. He can't even stand up. How do we go from there to imminent Ottoman capture of Constantinople? Well, you know, uh, every film needs a Luke Skywalker. You know, every every clash of, clash of empires needs the hero to enter from stage left. And just before 1450, in the Ottoman world, it's, it's Mehmed who becomes known as the Conqueror. Who's a kid. He's, what, 19 when he comes to power? Yeah, but, but Michael Owen was only 18 when he scored that goal against uh, Argentina in the World <laughs> Cup in 1998. And that's exactly the same. Yes, you're right. No, you're right. Of course you're right. Look, age is, age is something slightly different. I mean, it's interesting with, with Mehmed. I mean, we, we historians were very reluctant to talk about sort of the great man or great woman school of history, you know, it's on, on the shoulders of one person for, for very obvious reasons. But the the world that Mehmet finds himself at the top of as a young, ambitious, clever, sophisticated, well-educated young man is one where he has been trained to how to think about other people's strategic weaknesses and what his strengths are. And, you know, you can know yourself quite well if you've had the right kind of upbringing. But clearly the institutions that he's sitting on top of are highly invested behind that kind of leadership for it to work. So the military structure, the economy, the religious authorities, there's a full armed Death Star. I know that's mixing my Luke Skywalkers with uh, the, the good, the good, the baddies. But you know, the Ottomans are all ready to go, but they're in search of a, they're in search of a inspirational, brilliant leader. And, uh, and he is the right man at the right time for the right job. I mean, as I said, would it have mattered if they just carried on bypassing Constantinople for decades, centuries. You know, could it have been a free port, free city? I mean, the truth is that, is that the, the gains that were offered by Constantinople by this time are pretty modest. It's economically shri shriveled, a much lower population than at its peak. It's no longer an important trade hub as it once was. It's gone, gone from, what, a million in the 12th century to about 50,000? Well, I'd probably have it a half million, probably half that size in the 12th century. And I'd probably have it, yeah, about 50,000, I suppose. But, but what that doesn't tell you is that what has also happened in, in that period is that more trade has started to come up through the Red Sea and to reach 
Europe through different means. The 1450s are a hugely significant moment in Iberian exploration of the coasts of Africa that opens up gold, opens up new goods, new products, and sets the scene for slavery that then becomes institutional, transatlantic, and mass million. But so I think that that, that world of Constantinople is, is, a, is a shadow, but only a shadow of, of the past in the same way that you know, London is an imperial capital as it once was, but that there's no shame in that. But uh, Mehmed is the key part in, in working out how to finally solve the problem of taking control of, of Constantinople, which is symbolically hugely significant that the great city of Rome finally falls and to, to Mehmed himself. Well, I mean, you have, if Mehmet is the key, Constantinople is the lock, you have absolutely beautifully teed us up for the next episode. Um, Peter Frankopan, that was a tour de force, and we are so very grateful, really so, so grateful. And thank you very much. And when the new book comes out, we've got dibs on you. Peter, thank you so, so much. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, that is quite brilliant. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for today on the Empire Pod. So what have these very lovely people got to look forward to next week, Willie? It's one of the great stories of history. It's the moment that the Ottomans capture Constantinople. Uh, And as I say, it's also my favourite history book. Why did you blow the ending again? (laughs) It is the one where the butler did it. It's the one where they all died at the end. It's the one. It was the lead pipe. It was the lead piping. The children got away with it. Because, you know, (laughs) you do it every time. Anyway, yes. So we will see you then. Uh, Until then, it's goodbye from me, Anita Arnon. And it's goodbye from me, William Durumple. 